Hi, I'm Laura, and it's a pleasure to be here today virtually with the High Country Water Media Society. I'm going to show you a demo that I filmed while I was painting this watercolor of a little chickadee in a tree. If you remember, you have probably already received a reference photo and drawing, but since this video will remain on YouTube afterwards, I will also provide a link to the reference photo in the description below. And if you are a member of the High Country Water Media Society, I will be looking forward to visiting with you virtually in a couple of weeks for a live critique session on Facebook. And if you have any questions between now and then, feel free to leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer. So let's get started. All right, so this is the reference photo I'm using. It's a photo I took of a chickadee in wintertime, and I'm going to make it look like summertime with green leaves in the trees, but winter's a great time for photographing birds because they're, um, well, all the leaves are gone and you can see them much better, especially when it's snowy. And I did a drawing on another piece of paper and then traced it onto my watercolor paper here. And before I started recording, I mixed up a few puddles um, to go ahead and show you what I have mixed before I start. This is quinacridone gold, thalo blue, and a little bit of transparent red oxide mixed in. That helps kind of neutralize your greens a little bit. It's, that's a great tool, the transparent red oxide for making greens. And this is quinacridone gold with just a little bit of the thalo blue in it. And this is mostly ultramarine blue. I think it might be all ultramarine blue. And I'm gonna mostly use the green for doing all of my um, leaves, but the yellow and the blue are for dropping in here and there and making those lovely watercolor mixes and mingles that happen on their own when you do that. All right. Now my first layer is going to cover most of the painting except for the bird and some areas that I'll want to leave a bit wider, um, like say up in this corner where we're gonna have the sun coming from. This brush has a little bit of green in it, but I'm really meaning for it to be. You can use just plain water there. And then I'm gonna go in with some green, and you see I'm not making any particular shapes. I've drawn in some leaves a little bit. I don't know how well you can see them. I didn't trace them, so they're not as heavy lines, but I've, I've drawn some little leafy shapes here and there, and I'm just painting right over them right now. They really don't matter because this is going to be our lightest layer, and everything that goes over it will be darker, and it's not going to be... Um, The other layers are going to be dark enough to cover up. And we'll do negative painting with it too. Now, before stuff starts drying too much, let me remember I'm going to drop in some yellows. And that area was a little bit too much white. I'm actually going to take a second brush, dropping in my yellow so I don't have to keep switching back and forth. I've got this brush over here that I'm mostly using and just using a second brush for those little yellow bits. Ultramarine blue. This is on, this motion is scumbling. Brush stroking would be like this. This is scumbling. I'm just kind of pushing my brush around more than painting or making any kind of strokes with it. A little bit bluer, 
over here because again our light's coming from this way and so in order to express that in the end we're going to make sure that we're always keeping things lighter this way darker this way and you see i didn't paint around my bird perfectly we're going to be doing more there and in fact you can mask that out if you prefer i do mask sometimes when i'm doing birds um but I didn't with the chickadee because most of his important parts are black anyway. And so it's going to cover up anywhere that I didn't do the edge perfectly. And um, I like the way edges look better when they're not masked. Though I should have pointed out, this bird does have a dot of masking fluid on his eye. I should have said that sooner because he looks a little wild-eyed, but in the end, that will be a little light spot on his eye and won't. It'll be white while his eye is black and he won't look so crazy-eyed, hopefully anyway. All right, so that's, that's about what I'm looking for with the first layer. You'll notice I went back with water toward the end and softened some edges. Um, that were pretty hard. I'm going to do that a little bit right here, here too. And these branches are also, I mean, they're going to be darker, so it's okay to just paint over them and not even worry about what's there. All right, well, I'm going to pause the video real quick and dry this with a hair dryer. You can feel free to do the same. All right, everything's all dry everywhere. And I'm gonna start on another layer, going over everything but the bird. And it's gonna be fairly similar to the previous layer, but in that first layer, we were just kind of creating a baseline background, and this time we'll do more leafy shapes as we go. And I'm going to do a little bit of negative painting on this layer, but it will mostly come in the next layer. I'm just going to kind of, with my pencil, suggest some places I might want leaves. Um, I kind of washed away the leaves that I had drawn before, um, which I didn't, I don't mind that. Maybe over here. Some of those I might abandon, but they're there as suggestions for me as I'm painting to say, oh yeah, I might... I might leave a leafy shape there. I'll show you what I mean. So I'm over here on my palette. Just getting a little bit more green ready. Same colors as before. And this time I'm going to start more back here and work my way forward because there will be more leafy shapes over here than here because over here it's going to be more shady in the end and they will be adding more leafy shapes then. Where's my second brush? There it is. my ultramarine blue again. Hmm. Good brush helps a lot here. This is the um Cheap Joe's number 18 Dragon's Tongue. It holds a lot of water paint and it keeps a nice point and it makes nice leaf shapes. <sighs> Actually, no, I'm gonna 
I'll put negative pink those in the next step or so. Here I'm just looking at what I've done, saying this would look a little bit better if I did this or that. Softening some edges, adding a little bit more color in other spots. His feet are going to be dark, so I'm not worrying about painting around those too carefully. And I'm going to add a good bit more blue over on this side. Make it a bit more shadowy. And the reason I use the thalo blue and my green wash and ultramarine blue to drop in is that the thalo blue is a cool blue and therefore makes a brighter, kind of cleaner green. And ultramarine blue being warm neutralizes it a little bit more. And so I like the contrast there where when I mix the ultramarine blue in, it doesn't just add to the same green. It, it adds a little bit of something that wasn't already there instead of more of something that was like the ultramarine blue. I mean, I'm sorry, the thalo blue, it's already in there. All right, I think that'll about do it for the second layer. And again, I really covered most of the painting a second time, but because I did that base layer, it gives spots to peek through that aren't white, and it just really helps um, create depth when we're doing these multiple layers like this. I'm going to wipe these off around the edges here. Take out my handy dandy hair dryer and I'll be back with you in a minute. Okay, so my paper's all dry and I've mixed some new puddles. Same ingredients, different ratios. So this is quinacridone gold and thalo blue and a little bit of the transparent um, red oxide. This is the same three, but there's very little quinacridone gold in there. It's mostly thalo blue and the transparent red oxide. And those two colors, even though this is a red earth tone and this is a blue, they mix together to make a nice dark green. And then this is my ultramarine blue again. And each of these puddles is a little thicker than before. Um, Y'all might be familiar with the you know, you have tea, milk, coffee, and cream, and butter for your different consistencies. And so I started out with more like a tea, and these are more like maybe a milk. They're nice and good on wet washes, but they're not as thin as before, so we're going to get some nice darker values. Credit for the tea, coffee, milk, cream, and butter goes to, and I hope I'm not butchering his name, Joseph Zbukvich. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with my big dragon's tongue brush again, and also use this smaller brush, which I didn't mention last time, is actually just an old brush whose tip is worn down a lot. And I like using it for leafy things because it's softer and it has that nice, um, not pointy 
point. For the same reason as last time, I'm going to start in the corner again. And this time I'm going to do a little bit more to define with my pencil. Um, a lot of these lines have washed away just a little bit where it's hard to see them and bring back these shapes. And this time I'm really going to work on making clumps of leaves and individual leaves here and there. It's going to be, um, we finish the layers that are more like background. Leaves come, leaves come in all sorts of shapes, so I don't feel obligated to be too careful when I'm drawing my leafy shapes. brush has just water. And as I've done it other times, I'm just putting things where I think they look good. Um, That leaf's like a little bit too light, I think. Didn't fit in too well, so I went over it and I'll paint around it in the next stage or so. By the way, I've become aware a little bit ago that my table and my chair both creak, which which I knew, but um, that's what you hear. <laughs> it's my, my stool that I sit on and my table. Okay, so that's some negative painting. I painted around the leaves instead of painting the leaves themselves. So it's a negative paint. You don't paint the object, you paint around the object. And it makes an object. These shapes. That beak is going to be black, so I'm not stressing too much about painting it perfectly. It's water. Ultramarine blue. Put some water over here where this is drying. And actually covering probably more than I anticipated doing, but that's okay.
And over here in this shadowy corner, I'm going to really fill in a bit with the ultramarine blue. Okay, so I've done what I set out to do with this layer, and now I'm going to look it over and say, am I happy with it everywhere? And I don't like the way that it's kind of really light and white all the way across the top and all the way down on this side so evenly. So I'm going to fix that. Just filling in a little bit of scumbling with the paint and then a little bit of scumbling with water. This is what I love about watercolor is like right here, for instance, where this leaf was painted, I just went back over it and you can still see it. It's one of the first things that I fell in love with about watercolor is how you paint various layers and you can still see the layers underneath. Everything that you do counts, even if you cover it up later. I like that. And didn't even really hardly use my super dark mix yet. Do that now. And some of my areas are quite dry, like over here, but th these are still shiny. So that's why I'm able to go ahead and drop these darker colors in, and they're spreading around nicely. Let's see here. I think that's probably dry enough that we could. Do some shapes. Okay, let me stand up and have a good look. I like wiping my edges off because looks better and lets you look at the painting better and it makes sure that you don't end up with stuff running off of your um, tape and back onto your paper. All right, I think that looks pretty good. I'm going to stop the video again and use my hair dryer and I'll be back with you in just a sec. Okay. So my paper's all dry. I also like to let it cool a little bit. So when I'm finished drying it with the hairdryer, I hit it with cool air for a few minutes and then work on mixing up some paint while it finishes cooling. I'm going to be using the same mixes again, so just to show you a glance, but this time I'm gonna be going mostly with the really dark wash I have of my phthalo blue and transparent red oxide. And then I'll use a little bit of the other two puddles, which Again, while they're the same colors, I am changing ratios and making them thicker. Um, so right before I started recording, I mixed those up thicker than what they were before. All right, and this, if I didn't already say so, should be the last layer that I'm doing on the background unless I decide to just add something later. And I'm switching to a number 10, it's the Escoda Versatile um, brush, brown brush. And get started kind of over here. 
not even quite as dark as I mean for it to be. And just a little bit. Let's see. Oh yeah, that's nice. Some real depth in there. Dark colors. Dark values. That is. And in this stage I am painting around the branches. And some of these leafy shapes are going to be over the branches in the end, and some are not. I'm going to have a nice leafy section here. I think these are a little too pale. And yeah, this layer is pretty dark. I do want to paint around my bird carefully here. Ultramarine. Trying to remember to hold the brush in such a way where you can see what I'm doing, so I apologize if there are times that I forget and you can't see what I'm doing. Stand up and get a better look. Hmm. I think it's coming along pretty well. I have to be careful to not overdo it here. It's easy to do, get carried away. Hmm. 
Part right here will help. It'll help make it um, help it make more sense when there's branches. All right, I think. Oh, just a little bit more. That's when you know to stop. Just a little bit more. <laughs> I'm gonna break that rule. Just a little bit more. But I did see a demo one time. I think it was Linda Baker several years ago. She said, how do you know when a watercolor is done? She said, right before you say one more thing. <laughs> it's true quite often. All right. Well, there isn't a whole lot of drying to do this time because it's... um. You know, those washes weren't all that wet in the first place, but there's a little bit, so I am going to pause it and hit it with my dryer real quick. Next thing I'm going to do is paint one layer on the branches, and it's going to be pretty easy. I'm going to use just one puddle that I've mixed up of transparent red oxide and ultramarine blue. And it's so funny how you, or so interesting anyway, how you can mix together transparent red oxide and phthalo blue, and they make a dark green. Then you mix transparent red oxide with ultramarine blue, and they make a nice rich brown. It's um, another one of the cool things about watercolors is how different pigments behave, even if they seem to be in the similar, um, you know, they might be two blues, so they're two of the same hue family, but they work completely differently. Okay, so that's what that is there. I'm going to use this brush again, my um, pointy Escoda. Test it on a scrap. Might have to go just a little darker. And the more blue you use in that mixture, the more it'll be a grayish brown. And then, of course, the more of the red oxide you use, the more of a rich, warmer brown that you'll get. There, that's nice. Okay. So I want the leaves to be on top of the branches in some areas and not in other areas. I'm going to start with the easy part, which is, well... I'm sorry, I was about to say here because this is an area that there is no overlap and that would be the easier part and that is true, but since it's the lower branch, if, then when I do this one, I'd be dragging my hand across this branch. So I'm going to change my mind and start with this branch. There will be two layers on the branches. The first one I'm going to do now, and the second one will be um, just some spots of darker value, um, which I'll do after I'm finished with the bird. I was thinking while I had it paused, but I don't think I've said yet. If you're wondering why I do the bird last, um, there are several reasons. I would say the biggest reason is so that I don't mess it up while I'm painting the other things. Um, and once I have a nice little bird painted, I, I don't want to drip on him. Um, I don't want to drip on him even before I've painted him, but there's less I can do about it when I'm finished. Yeah. 
And here's what I meant about there's a long stretch right here where there aren't any leaves to worry about painting around. Of course, when you're doing yours, you'll have your um, leafy spots in different places, I assume, because that's how you make them random, is you make the choices as you go and aren't trying to stick too closely to following along with you know, a certain um, exact placement of leaves. That's so good. Little feet are going to be dark. I'm not striving for perfection there. Just trying to just make sure I didn't paint completely over them. I like to add little bumps here and there. Something else that I didn't draw. It's just something I want to think about. You see, I make so many decisions as I go. Decide to paint around something, then change my mind and fill it in. And then, of course, there's the less preferable um, fill something in and then wish you hadn't. <laughs> All right. I think that it could probably use a little bit more in this area in the way of leaves, but. That's something I'm going to worry about, as I said, after I'm done with the bird and the branches and everything. There's always that time at the end where you see how everything has come together and you decide if you're um, happy with the way it is or if there's anything else you should do. going to dry this and then we'll start on the bird and then after the bird we'll do a little bit more uh, work with the values of the branches. Okay now it's time to bring this little chickadee to life. Chickadees have black caps and black throats quite whitish through this area around on their tummy and abdomen they're whitish gray um, from a distance, they look pretty white, but really they have a lot of gray and then some warmer grays in here. And then across their back, and wings and tail, it's, um, depending on the chickadees, some have more of a blue-gray, some are more of a neutral gray. This one's fairly neutral. I'll probably enhance the blue a little bit more than what it really is. So, our little bird here needs a little bit of work. help really um, help me prepare to paint his features and I, I wouldn't have wanted to trace these lines because they're really faint and um, when you use tracing paper the lines aren't erasable like this one that I did with tracing paper it won't come off. Um, they have graph graphite tracing paper that erases better, but it also smudges all over the paper, so um, can't really win there. It's 
See, I'm just kind of suggesting these lines. This here, and these lines, and these lines. So there's that there. These lines, and these lines. And this leg will show a little bit up into his body. And this one will not. Okay. So he's a little bird. I'm going to use a little brush and it's another one that's a little old and worn down. So it's a round brush, but just old. It's a number four. And I've mixed up two petals. Let's see if I can fit them under here since I haven't zoomed in. This looks quite dark. Um, I'm not going to use it that dark though. I'm going to take some water and mix it. Um, I'll keep my puddle over here that's dark for use for later, but when I want it to be really light, I'll just take some water over here in the corner. And then, so, oh, this is a mixture between ultramarine blue and burnt sienna by Daniel Smith. And you may know that pigments really vary amongst brands. So Daniel Smith's Burnt Sienna does not contain the same pigments as others. And they all vary in Burnt Sienna. Some are fairly consistent. Ultramarine Blue uses the same pigment across like every brand. But some, like Burnt Sienna, seem to be different through every brand. And does it matter? Well, I mean, kind of, because they're going to make different hues depending on which pigment. So Daniel Smith's Burnt Sienna and plus Ultramarine Blue make fabulous grays um, ranging from very cool grays to very warm grays and everything in between. That's a great combination for making grays. And then this other little bit I have, this very watery little puddle, is um, a touch of quinacridone gold, a touch of transparent red oxide, and a touch of ultramarine blue. So what it is is a slightly... Um, colored mm, warmish brown kind of and I'm going to be using that for like little bits in here you, in the reference photo you can't tell perfectly but th there are some warmer hints in here than what I think you can see and I'm going to go over all of the dark areas with a gray including his um, head but first, I'm going to do these little light areas of his belly, and there's going to be a lot of dry brushing with that. So where's my little paper scrap? Oh, here's one. So that's not quite light enough. That's pretty light. And I'm going to get my brush pretty good and dry. So I've wiped most of it off. And if you're familiar with dry brushing, that's great. And this is going to be very dry brushing. And I'm going to, in order to make his little feathery um, bits, I'm going to kind of um, start this way. And I have to pay attention closely during this part, so I'm, I'm probably not going to say anything and just let you watch. Okay, not enough. It's better to have too little than too much here. So if you see me doing it and saying, oh, it's not enough repeatedly, it's um, because I'm making sure that I'm not doing too much. Even when I'm, you hear me getting water and blending, I'm still um, wiping my brush off so it's pretty dry. I really just want to make these nice feathery um, drugs. And it really is important to go up with your strokes when you're doing this because his feathers grow down and so the pointier 
part of his feather is going to be facing this way, and by going up, you make it so that where your strokes separate, it um, works in your favor as far as suggesting which way his feathers are going. Touch of that warmer color. It's still... Um, mixes that I showed you on my palette. And I'm sure this looks quite light on your screen and a good large part of the reason is because it is <laughs> very light. Slightly darker around his wing. Pretty much always paint in layers, of course. Um, generally working lightest to darkest. So I'm just doing all the lightest work on him first. see he has just a little bit of a suggestion of a cheek there. He really does look wild-eyed with that spot of masking fluid there. It looks like he's kind of looking over there. Um, but again, that will be white when we finish painting, and hopefully he's not going to look so wild-eyed. Okay, now since that's pretty thin, I'm not going to need to use the hair dryer on it. And I already have this mixed up with my Ultramarine Blue and Burnt Sienna, so I'm going to go back over to this darker side of the pile, or puddle. Not real dark, but darker than what I was doing here. And even though his head's going to be black, I'm going to cover it with the gray first. I'm, I'm going to cover everywhere that's going, going to end up being darker than this color. Yes, even his eye. It's already better. As far as his wild eyed look. That's his head. Now here is quite light on the top of his back and wings, and then it gets darker. blending with water here but it's a dry brush not dry dry but it's a the technique of dry brush a little bit of a white accent on his wing there Look at him, he's already coming to life. That's good. Chickadee's legs are pretty gray also, so I'm just going to go ahead and put one of 
little Meyer here. And then we'll come back and shape his feet with the dark gray or black in a bit. There. Oops, dropped the brush. Okay, so I did a bit of an all over color for his body. Now I'm going to try to make a little bit more texture with a slightly darker value here and a few slightly darker places in here. Let's say slightly darker, it's an understatement, it's not dark at all. Just little suggestions. And I know it's difficult to see exactly what everything looks like here because it's so light, but it's just the way it is. He has very subtle markings. He or she. Yeah. Chickadees don't differ in the sexes. All right. So... Kind of get a good look, yeah. Very lightly colored. <clears throat> Gentle strokes. And I'm going to do a little bit more of that on his head as well. That was paint. I can see the water. Softening it a little bit. And a little bit here where his black is going to blend in with his white. There. And this is going to be so light you might not even be able to see it. Oops. <laughs> Darker than I meant to. I love the way ultramarine blue causes this nice granulation. Lovely. All right. I'm going to use some more of this burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. I'm mixing them right now just a little darker than what I had them and a little bit more toward the blue than what I had before. Running out of room on this sheet. Yeah, that ought to do it. And so I'm going to be going over this area again. I'm not going to go over his black head anymore until I'm doing black. Lots of blending with a bird because they have lots of feathers all blending together, making their shapes. And his wings. You can 
can draw lines for his wings first if it makes you more comfortable, but I think it looks more natural if you don't, if you just look at the direction they're going and make some um, more randomish type strokes. about do it. I think you could use just a little bit more back here. So he's lighter, higher up on his back where he's closer to the sun and darker as he gets lower. Now the burnt sand and the ultramarine blue will make a nice, good dark as well. Um, you can make a color that's almost a black, even. And I'm going to use a mixture that's not, not that dark, not, not black, but a good bit darker. And do the lower part of his wing here. water and this is very very um, very slightly wet right there what I just did to kind of just soften that line just barely where the wing overlaps his body Looks about right. He definitely could use some more shading here, which is kind of hard to tell until doing this part because we didn't want to go too dark. So being careful. So I'm going to try to remedy that. Take a little bit of this color here that's just barely brownish. That's good. Still could use some more down here. Not too much, Laura. So much blending. Sometimes too much blending is a bad thing. But with birds, I think it's a little difficult to blend too much. can see on the video that this area appears to be almost white. Um, 
there now you can see that there is some variation here. Keep that in mind. All right. Um, I'm going to mix up some black to do his head and his eye with, and I'm going to pause it because it takes a moment. But what I'm going to be mixing is alizarin crimson and phthalo green. And you can make blacks with many different combinations of reds and greens. Um, viridian is a great one, alizarin crimson and viridian. Or pearl crimson and one of those dark greens. Those are all um, reds and greens mixed together. Um, make lots of good blacks. So I'm going to do that and I'll be right back. So here's the black puddle that I've mixed, and right now it's slightly more red than green. So I'm just going to add a little bit of this phthalo green, mix it in there. And it's very easy to go the wrong way. I don't know if you can tell, but now it's just a little bit too green. And I started recording when it wasn't quite finished so that you could see me doing this if you're not experienced in mixing black because Many watercolor artists aren't. Um, I do keep a tube black on my tray. This is lamp black, but I use it um, seldomly. And when I do use it, I'm more likely to be mixing it with transparent red oxide to darken a brown than I am to use it to actually um, paint black. All right. It's pretty thick. Water it down just a little bit because I don't want to go dark, dark black on the first pass. And since I was talking about alizarin crimson, I'd also like to note that it's another color that can be tricky to cross brands. Um, true alizarin crimson isn't used very often anymore because it's known as a fugitive color. In other words, it fades over time worse than, um, well, more than you would want it to. It's not a very stable color. So different brands have created um, different versions of alizarin crimson to substitute. And the one that I use is American Journeys alizarin crimson, and they use a quinacridone that is really nice. I, I like it a lot. So even though it's called alizarin crimson, it's not a true traditional alizarin crimson. A few brands, I believe, these days make a true alizarin crimson because it's a fugitive. All right. So I've got my black. Let's give it a little test run. Yeah, it's pretty nice. It's, um, it's definitely a black hue, but it's not super dark. And our little chickadee has his black head and throat, and his beak is black, but it's shadowy on the dark side, and so that's where you can really see the black, and the light shining on the top um, reflects off and makes it much lighter colors. You could probably see that yourself without me pointing it out, but it doesn't hurt. And then his legs are also blackish. And I've painted them gray, and I will go with the blacks and make these um, like kind of shadows to give his feet shape. I'll probably take just a tiny bit of black right here. Okay. The moment we all get nervous. Right before we... Take the brush to the page, take the plunge. I think we all get nervous at that point anyway. I know I do. That little voice in your head says, don't screw it up. You're doing good so far. Don't mess it up now. Oh, that's pretty nice. I 
think I have a bit more feathering than this bird does, but I, I like it that way. I think it looks nice. You need to rush this. It's a small area, so you're not going to be fighting drying too much. I love birds and one of the things I love best about painting birds is how they come to life as you paint them. Um, you remember at the beginning when he was just, or say even not at the beginning, but when all the background was done and he was just this white shape there, it looks like he would never be something that would appear alive. And I think it's around the time you paint their eyes that they really um, come to life. And I'm going to go over that darker once. Um, I, I tend to like to do everything in two layers. Uh, lots of reasons, but just to sum it up, it looks better. <laughs> okay, so a little bit. is water or a, a wet brush that's very dry very dry wet brush <laughs> nice looking nice I'm gonna extend this line a little bit His feet. Legs and feet. Although, technically, the joint that's right here that you can't see is technically his ankle. So, really, the whole thing here that you can see is part of his foot. So kind of going over right there. So if it's on top of the branch a little too much, I'll just take some water and fix that. Didn't look quite right, so I'm just messing with that a little bit more. Something else I'm going to do when I have some more green mixed is I will shape this a little bit to give them a little bit of uh, more of a fuzz butt going on there. what people call baby chicks like chicken chicks fuzz butts I think probably all birds could be called fuzz butts Put 
dinosaur feet. I'm lifting it a little bit there with water. I'm not sure I'm improving. That'll work, especially because, like I said, we're going to do one more layer on the branches, and I'll definitely be darkening the area under the chickadee. So even though I'm not thrilled with how his feet look right now, I, I don't think that it's going to um, be a problem when I'm done. And if so, I'll work on it then. All right, and I'm going to do a darker layer on his head now. Let's see, here's where I did before. So you see, alone, it's about the same as this, but on top of what I did before, it's a bit darker. And if you can leave a little bit of a line there around his eye, that's great. And if not, um, you can come back and fix it by lifting it out. I'll show you. I'll show you how. There. Uh, should I mess with his feet? Maybe just a little. The way his toes look here is it's a little funny. <laughs> okay. So there you have that. Um, this part here is still wet which is why it looks darker than this. And it might need another coat. I'm going to dry it and see. Okay, so I think he could use just a little bit more, um, that his head could be just a little bit darker. I should have gone a little darker with the last layer. But that's an easy fix. I think I'm gonna get out of here. Just a little bit. And a little bit of water. Kind of blend that out there. I think it needs just a little bit more. starting to dry on top so it's a little bit of a color variation there but yeah that's good um, I'm gonna pause it and I'll show you how to lift out a little bit around the eye in case you didn't get that and 
um, put another layer on the branches. Okay, so what you're going to need is a very tiny brush, if you have one. Um, if not, just carefully do it with the smallest brush you have. So I've got this wet. I'm going to make sure that it's not too wet. I'm especially drying off the ferrule here. And so I'm going to take it very carefully. Paint around his eye a little bit, getting it wet, and then I'm going to dab it. And you see I had painted around this bit here, but doing that has already extended it a little bit, and I'm going to do it again. And then dab. And for your dabbing, by the way, it's best to use... Um, like a Viva paper towel or maybe tissue if you don't have it. Um, something this small you could probably dab it with anything. But if you're dabbing something larger and you use a regular type paper towel, it has all the little bumps in it. Whereas this is more um, smooth Viva and you can press it down without it making little spots where the dimples were. Again, that would be if we were blotting a large area. All right, let's go ahead and remove this little bit of masking fluid from his eye. We don't need it anymore. Whoa, that's big. <laughs> He's very bright-eyed. <laughs> that's all right, though. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of black and, and make it a little bit smaller. <laughs> very carefully. And of course, if you didn't have masking fluid or forgot to use it, you could just um, use a little bit of white paint to do that. I like to avoid white paint when I can, but there's no shame in using it if you need it, um, especially in small quantities like that. Okay, so there's a good look at Mr. or Mrs. Chickadee. And I'm going to prepare to do the branches. All right, now I'm ready to work on the branches a little more. This is a puddle that I've just mixed up. It is sepia, transparent red oxide, and my ultramar ultramarine blue. Um, if you want to know a secret about sepia, it's actually transparent red oxide and lamp black mixed together in a tube. So you could make it with those two if you have those two and don't have a sepia. But as I mentioned, for a lot of my browns, I like to use transparent red oxide and ultramarine blue, just the two of them. And adding either sepia or lint black helps you just darken that mixture that's already a nice brown. So this is a fairly thick little puddle. This is kind of like, I would say, a cream. So you see it doesn't flow into a puddle as well. It kind of moves where you push it. It's the thickness of about a cream. Okay. So here's what we have so far. And what I'm going to do is just try to create a little bit more dimension on my branches. Let's see, where's the brush I'm looking for? I'm going to use this for color, but I need another one for blending. I think I'll, I'll just use this small one here. These are my two brushes that are old and the tips are quite rounded. I don't know if they sell brushes all already like that. I haven't seen any, but I don't think I've checked had these a long time. In fact, these were some of the first watercolor brushes I ever bought, I think, and they were pointy at the time. <laughs> Actually, this brush isn't quite large enough. 
numbers worn off of this. I think it's a six. Which, of course, is another thing that varies among brands anyway. <laughs> a six in one brand can be a completely different size from a six in another. Well, something nice about the way that we painted the green layers under the branches before we started painting the actual branches is that there's already a lot of variation. I hope that you can see um, here that gives texture to the branches so then they're not just black. And I'm leaning toward doing the undersides of the branches most because the sun's coming from this way. The sun isn't coming from up above, that's for sure. Okay, now I'm going to switch in the brush I was using for water I'm going to use for paint so I can get in these spots. And if I can improve upon his little foot. And since he's blocking some sunlight, put more dark under him. I do not think that I have improved his foot at all. But that's okay because you'll get to see me do a little bit of fixing and learning to fix your mistakes in watercolor is important because it's challenging. Dabbing a little bit at the top there. Pitch up and hear the crow outside. He might be wanting me to give him some cat food. I do sometimes. They don't come every day, but when they do, I take him some uh, <laughs> dry cat food. They like it. You came here for a painting lesson, but you might have learned a fair amount about birds today. For instance, the very useful information that crows like dry cat food. But if you want to know what a crow really likes, give them some unshelled peanuts or cashews. They love cashews. I don't spoil my crows that much, though. <laughs> I don't want them to come around every day. It's kind of noisy. I enjoy their occasional visits. And I know I'm not talking about what I'm doing. It's really just repetitive during this stage. Just kind of going around and making spots that are darker so we have variation and then also making um, it so that the undersides of the branches are a little bit more shadowy. It's gonna be funny as you can't even if is if you can't even hear the crow and you're saying, What is she talking about? Because he's out there making a lot of noise right now. My studio is in our sunroom. Which is great because I'm surrounded by beautiful views of outside all day. Alright. That's more or less what I was going for. It could, um, I don't know, 
I was about to say, it might be able to use a little bit more variation, but I think that's pretty good. Be able to tell more when it dries. I'm going to pause it for just a moment. Yeah, I think that works. Because my first wash on the branches was pretty dark, it didn't make a huge, huge difference. Um, but I think that doing more to just make them um, have more variation isn't probably a great idea. If you get too dark with watercolor, you end up with, and too many layers, you end up with um, areas that are shiny where the light is reflecting off of the paint and not the paper which takes away another one of the best parts of watercolor that paint reflects off of the paper and not the paint okay now let's see what we can do about these little dinosaur feet down here I ended up with his toes going too far this way I'm going to take a wet brush, see if I can, make this better. It's not fabulous. I think that'll about do. I am going to darken them a bit, which will also help. Also help bring out his little toe back here. Yeah. Yeah, I think that does it. I've been looking at the background and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I think that it could use just a little bit more and not in the one more thing sense. But this is a reasonable stage to look at what you did because I haven't worked on the background at all since adding the bird and the branches. So it's reasonable to think that there might be things that I would want to adjust now that the other things are in. Not at all the same as just looking at a painting that you've already worked on everywhere and you feel like you're good. And then, oh, well, babe, just maybe one more thing. Not the same. But even that sometimes called for, of course. All right, I'm going to mix up a little bit of green, and I'll be right back. Okay. So I'm going to do a little bit more right here with a little bit of negative painting to help make this a bushier sort of area. I've got this mixture ready again that was the um, transparent red oxide and phthalo blue. Mix that nice. The brush is too small. Makes that nice dark green. Just those two colors. Maybe a little bit more over here too. Which 
fishing out for my bird. And see, I didn't have to be nearly as careful before I painted the bird. Um, because if I got a little bit of green on there, I could have just, you know, um, cleaned it off a little bit. Whereas right now, it's painted, and if I get something on it, it's not going to be nearly as easy to do something about. I think that might do it for the background. But I paused and lifted it up and held it away from my face a good distance so I could get a look at it, which is pretty important to do. Kind of step back from your painting Look at it from a little bit of a distance. Can't do that when it's on my table with a, especially with a camera in front of it. So I'm gonna just lighten a little bit back here. It's a little bit too um, flat. It needs a little bit more dimension, although. It's already done a decent bit to help with that. Now, one thing that I meant to show you and forgot is how to do some scraping to add some additional branches and Usually you would do this at the same time as you're doing your washes. Um, I'm going to use a razor blade. There are lots of things you can use. Cut up credit card. Um, sharpened end of a paintbrush or a skewer. But I like the razor blade because you can vary the width quite well. And you scratch it into it while the paint is still wet. Um, again though, I forgot to show you while my paint was still wet. So I'm going to kind of wet this. It won't, won't work quite as well, but it will still work. Oh, it doesn't, didn't work very badly at all. That was my cat Milo. It's over two hours till dinner time, but he's already starting to hang around. All right, where else? Maybe right here. When you do the scraping will dictate what kind of effect it has. So that's something you want to experiment with. Um, if the wash is very wet and you just do like a line, it'll make a darker place. What I'm doing is in, um, you know, it's wetter, even though it's just with water, it's loosened up what's under it and it scrapes the paint away more. Definitely something you can play around with and learn all sorts of things. It's funny how on my paper this looks very runny on the camera, I can see, but it's the way the light's shining on it. Right and okay. oops. Be careful with these, by the way. Hopefully, I don't need to tell you that. All right. Well, I might be overdoing it a little bit, but I wanted to show you. I think that's good. Well, 
over here kind of needs it. All right, I think that's going to about do it. A lot of times my students, or sometimes my students, especially the ones that are newer to painting, don't want to sign their paintings. Um, and what I always say to that is, well, how do you know when it's finished? So I'm mixing up a little bit of this black here. It could be the dark brown or anything. Um, the black is what I still have some of that's fairly dark. Let's see, is it good, pretty good and dark? I don't know, I think it could use a little bit more darkness. I'm going to pause it. You might be thinking you don't need to see me sign it. You know how to sign your name. I used to always do it with a pen because I thought it was too hard to paint it. And I was having a workshop with Mary White a few years ago. And I told her that my signature was too curly to sign with a brush. And she told me I was wrong <laughs> and that I should learn to sign with a brush. So I did. It's not as perfect as with a pen, but I like it better. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, maybe even learned a thing or two. Thank you very much to the High Country Water Media Society in the beautiful North Carolina mountains for having me do this demonstration. I'll be very much looking forward to seeing your paintings and discussing them with you guys in a couple of weeks. So happy painting.